yes kapil we can proceed okay good morning sir good morning good morning kapil good to see you good morning all i welcome you all to this morning session of day 4 of online lectures on ma part 1 second semester english program prescribed by nagpur university and being organized jointly by rajkumar kebal ramani mahila ma vidyalay jari patka nagpur basantrao naik government institute of arts and social sciences nagpur mahila mahavidyalay nandanvan nagpur and jm patel arts commerce and science college bhandara the resource person for the session dr supanta bhattacharya does not need any introduction it is just a formal way of beginning the proceedings that we have to do this a well known figure in academic and literary circles a gold medalist in masters in english university topper in mphil is a celebrated theater personality he has acted in over 150 english bangla hindi and marathi plays has participated in bon vita school quiz and bbc mastermind open quiz he had conducted quizzes at national level and has won all india poetry prize conducted by british council and poetry society of india he has worked on the project on abindranath tagore and translated two volumes of of plays by mahesh el kunjwar which has been published by oxford university and is working with the department of english at his club college on the post of associate professor he is director for uh, pg classes of english and coordinator of the research center on behalf of all of all the four colleges i welcome sir and uh, i for the uh, i hand over the mic to sir for for the proceedings thank you dr singhel thank you so much dr singhel for your kind words thank you kartik for helping with the uh, helping on the technical front good morning friends good morning everybody at the beginning let me acknowledge my uh, gratitude to the organizers of this post uh for uh, allowing me to be here this morning and uh, discuss uh, a verse play by one uh, writer who has had a tremendous influence on my career uh that is thomas stearns eliot and um, today we are going to uh, go through his uh, celebrated uh, verse play the family reunion which is prescribed uh, to the ma second semester students uh, in the modern drama course uh, now before we begin with eliot uh, i have been informed that uh, i'll also have to uh, briefly cover some of the uh, background topics uh, prescribed to you uh, is that right dr singhel yeah 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 so no problem and uh, we'll just briefly uh the uh, glance through uh, the the various uh, topics which have been uh, prescribed in your syllabus so first let us begin with uh, uh, the the topic uh, drawing room drama now the drawing room as you all well know uh, is actually a room in the house which is used to entertain visitors outsiders now this space this room gave its name to the drawing room drama or drawing room plays all right also uh occasionally referred to as uh, the comedy of manners and um, the well made play which are all variants of the uh, drawing room play and uh, this gave rise to uh, uh, an entire genre of theatrical productions where the entire action from curtain up to curtain down okay would be uh, would take place inside the confines of a drawing room what was also called a, a box set a drawing room box set but these are uh, technical terms in theater which we don't have to concern ourselves about so uh, beginning with the early forms of drama the drawing room play uh, uh, evolved to encompass comedy and um, serious drama okay as well as um, uh, plays like you know if we go to america uh, death of a salesman which takes place mostly uh, inside the the living room which is of course a tragedy 
so all forms all genres of um, drama are uh, c- covered in this uh, sub genre called uh, drawing room drama there have been drawing room dramas which consists entirely of monologues okay dramatic monologues so now uh, in the uh, late 20th and early 21st century this format has uh, uh, kind of been uh, become obsolete it has been discarded all right now uh, theater has evolved and uh, it has uh, the drawing room uh, drama has fallen out of favor but uh, still the format continues to provide a source of entertainment uh, drawing room comedy typically features um, uh, verbal banter verbal exchanges verbal wit all right uh, all of you know about oscar wilde's uh, masterpieces like the importance of being a earnest uh, lady windermere's fan okay the ideal husband okay and uh, so uh, there's a lot of verbal banter and the characters uh, uh, they are usually uh, they belong to the upper middle classes all right or the upper classes very affluent a uh, lot of time on their hands they have a lot of leisure all right very genteel very upper class characters and uh, so as i told you drawing room comedy is also associated with other um, categories like comedy of manners and um, the well made play okay and uh, many writers like oscar wilde and uh, noel coward noel coward would be talking about a little later uh, they are you know they specialize in this uh, drawing room format uh, bernard shaw uh, especially in plays like hardwick house uh, he added an undercurrent of uh, social criticism to uh, the well made play and in the 50s and 60s you had a number of films from uh, britain and uh, hollywood which also were plays basically uh, set within uh, the drawing room so uh, this genre developed during the victorian period in britain and um, uh, you know the uh, we can't really uh, directly ascribe any date or authority to the evolution of the drawing room play but uh, what used to happen is in the victorian era uh, the children and the uh, younger generation of the family they would put up short sketches short skits for visitors for guests uh, for their entertainment so uh, i mean these sketches would be so written and so designed that the drawing room became a kind of a, a set itself and uh, so these short entertainments eventually evolved into the the drawing room comedy and uh, obviously the ingredients the constituent elements of drawing room comedy drawing room drama very from a play to play but uh, basically the general formula remains the same okay and usually uh, the setting is a you know a drawing room in a town house uh, when we come to uh, the family reunion you'll see that um, eliot of course was uh, a great proponent of uh, uh, setting his plays uh, in the drawing room although they were not comedies they were very serious plays and some of them were tragedies but the confidential clerk and um, uh, the family reunion the elder statesman uh, other than uh, murder in the cathedral but in most of his plays they have a uh, a drawing room ambiance a drawing room setting and uh, so uh, it usually takes place in a, a country mansion and uh, you can see french windows in the backdrop and outside probably there are the inevitable tennis courts and uh, numerous servants come and go and uh, the characters Uh, they take their uh, social significance uh, as granted okay um, and they have uh, they are affluent uh, ladies and gentlemen of uh, private income private means and um, uh, time on their hands a little lot of time on their hands what is the principal occupation of these characters romantic pursuits a little love affairs and uh, lots of uh, uh, complications occur will a b reconcile with b will ex pair off with y so there are uh, rarely any um, you know uh, any uh, significant issues uh, which are discussed in um, uh, a drawing room comedy yes uh, the serious drawing room plays definitely as we shall see when we come to ts eliot who just um, borrowed the 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 format who borrowed the um, uh, you know the the basic uh, structure of uh, the drawing room drama and um, used it to uh, write his own plays based on spiritual um, uh, conundrums and spiritual questions 
so uh, and usually the denouma the the conclusion of uh, a drawing room play is very positive and upbeat and uh, occasionally uh, there are a few um, i won't say obscene but risque elements all right elements which are a little uh, off color and uh, a little quote unquote adult okay uh, but on the whole um, uh, a drawing room comedy is morally quite orthodox all right it's uh, um morally uh, very straight forward and um, love may mean sex but uh, in the final reckoning it is sex within the marital confines sex within marriage only and there are a lot add uh, to this mix plenty of jokes and comic details and you have plays like uh, oscar wilde's uh, plays um uh, women of no importance then uh, the ideal husband lady windermere's fan um and of course uh, the importance of being honest then we have uh, arthur pinero's uh, gay lord quex uh, william somerset mom whom most of us know as a novelist but he was also a very uh, popular and uh, a very in demand uh, playwright all right mom's uh, lady frederick and uh, noel coward's multiple plays including relative values on the other side of the atlantic you have uh, philip barry and essen berman okay so uh, now uh, uh the drawing room uh, play is uh, uh no longer as much in vogue but yet these old plays or right, they are often revived and uh, the comedy uh, in these plays uh, thrives on uh, class consciousness usually there is a class uh, difference between uh, you know the uh, the suitor who arrives at the mansion to woo the uh, the girl of the family and there's a class difference between um, the the hero and uh, his heroine and um, it's a it's a very rigid and rarefied class system which has almost become uh, uh, which has almost disappeared now all right post 80s post uh, the uh, you know uh, post uh, margaret thatcher and after brexit to uh, now uh, virtually uh, the the class distinctions they have become uh, prehistoric or the thing of prehistoric curiosity only and um, this is why because uh, drawing room comedy um, depended so much on this class distinction uh, business it never really became uh, uh, never really took root in um, egalitarian america and um, uh, in britain yes it became very popular uh, and continued to remain popular till the 1950s and 60s but in america uh, you'll find stray exceptions of popular drawing room comedies and i already gave you quite a few examples and uh, uh, in 2006 uh, uh, there was this play by paul Rod rudnick r u d n i c k paul rudnick and the play was called regrets only and this was a big hit this was a contemporary uh, instance of uh, a drawing room comedy and uh, 2006 it became a, a huge uh, box office hit uh, other authors in this genre would be uh clement scott and uh, walter besson uh, grace lewis and uh, uh, arnold bennett all right so these are some of the other names who uh, some of the other dramatists some of the other playwrights who uh, tasted varying degrees of success so far as drawing room uh, drama uh, was concerned now one name uh, very intricately uh, inextricably associated with this genre is noel coward all right noel coward who was uh, you know who played uh, multiple roles he was uh, basically a playwright but he was also a composer all right he was a director a very good actor excellent actor you can check out his uh, videos on youtube and he was also a singer and in his plays you'll find you know he's uh, multiply oscar wilde by um, uh, three or four times and you get noel coward all right in his plays there's a lot of wit there's a lot of flamboyance and uh, the time magazine uh, paid him a tribute by saying um, in um, uh, uh, noel coward's play uh, there is a sense of personal style a combination of cheek and chic pose and poise okay so very suave very upper class very uh, dapper uh, characters and again as in uh, as is typical of drawing room comedy Uh, none of the characters they have any serious concerns. All right, they are not worried about where their next meal is going to come from. 
All right, they are not worried about any other uh, complications in their lives. All right, most of these plays they are very romantic in nature. Boy chasing girl, overcoming obstacles, and eventually getting the girl and living happily ever after. So um, uh, Noel Coward was also, as I said, an actor, and he made his stage debut at the age of eleven. And uh, as a teenager, he was introduced to this elite society, to the high society. in which most of his plays would be set and uh, then he started writing plays in his uh, late teens and early 20s and he achieved enduring success as a playwright even today many of his plays are uh, quite often revived and uh, he has published uh, more than 50 plays he was born in the year 1899 and died in 1973 at the age of 74 okay so uh, his uh, uh, classic plays like uh, hay fever Uh, private lives uh, design for living present laughter uh, and blind spirit most of them have also been um, uh, converted into movies okay so uh, uh, coward's plays uh, they have remained in the regular uh, theater repertoire he composed hundreds of songs uh, and a lot of uh, musical what are called reviews okay and musicals and um, short musical sketches uh including writing um uh, you know uh, the uh, what are they called A areas for uh, operettas or right? small operettas bitter sweet and uh, he wrote uh, a number of almost uh, uh, dozens of um, uh, comic sketches screen plays uh, poetry he also wrote short stories uh, i have read one of his novels pomp and circumstance and he wrote uh, a three volume autobiography as well and uh, he was active on the stage uh, and uh, as a playwright for almost 6 decades and he acted in many of his own works as well as those of others uh, when the second world war uh, happened um, coward uh, volunteered and he uh, went from um, uh, various uh, front to front and uh, he went to various fronts and uh, entertained uh, the troops and he also worked with the uh, the secret service and it is believed that coward was very influential in uh, persuading america to help britain in its war efforts and uh, in 1943 coward was given an honorary oscar award an academy award uh, he for uh, this naval film drama in which we serve all right he made a film called in which we serve for which he got the uh, oscar an honorary oscar and he was knighted in the year 1969 and um, in 1950s he started uh, performing as a um, cabaret uh, performer cabaret uh, please don't go by uh, what uh, bollywood uh, the sense of uh, sense bollywood has made of the term cabaret but these are actually um, very funny hilarious um, uh, song and dance routines which uh, coward performed on the stage and some of his songs are still very popular Uh, i uh, i went to a marvelous party all right then mad dogs and englishmen go out in the afternoon sun all right these songs are still very popular you can um, uh, listen to all these songs they are all available on uh, youtube as videos okay and london pride is another song covered is uh, famous for so in the 60s and 70s many of his works were revived all right and um, uh, he became uh, he once again discovered fresh popularity just before his death and even today many of coward's uh, uh, dramatic elements are incorporated into modern plays and uh, he continues to influence popular culture uh, um, his uh, biographies after his death they reveal the fact that uh, coward uh, was gay all right he was a homosexual but he did not openly uh, publicly uh, acknowledge his homosexuality but uh, one or two uh, biographies which came out including you know uh, which included his uh, letters and uh, diary entries all right they have revealed the fact and now uh, that new information about coward is uh, has compelled critics to reanalyze his work and uh, to discover elements of homoeroticism in his plays okay so that was uh, uh, noel coward and uh, the other uh, playwright which is uh, who is mentioned in your uh, um, uh, background uh, this thing 
uh, in your uh, course background is uh, Alan Agborn. Alan Agborn is still alive. He was born in 1939, and um, uh, he was he's a very um, uh, prolific British playwright and director. And uh, by the latest count, Agborn has written more than 80 full-length plays. Not just imagine, not just uh, short plays, but full-length feature plays. Right, 80. And um, um, again, an extremely popular mainstream uh, playwright. All his plays have been repeatedly performed and revived. And he himself uh, was the artistic director of the Stephen Joseph Theatre in Scarborough. Okay, and um, uh, he has been associated with the Royal National Theatre, uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company. And uh, his first hit was a play called Relatively Speaking. And afterwards, he wrote plays like Absurd Person Singular, uh, the Norman Conquest Trilogy, uh, Bedroom Fast, Just Between Ourselves, A Chorus of Disapproval, uh, Woman in Mind, um, uh, A Small Family Business, Man of the Moment, uh, House and Garden, Private Fears in Public Places. Again, many of these films they have been uh, made into, uh, many of his uh, plays have been made into films. Uh, his plays have won numerous awards um, and um, he keeps regularly winning the, the British Theatre Awards, the um, you know, Tony Awards. Okay, I think 10 or 12 of his plays have won Tony Awards. Many of his plays have been translated into uh, different languages and are regularly performed on stage and television throughout the world. Again, in Alan Agbon's plays, you'll find uh, social commentary. All right? He's writing plays with uh, characters coming from the upper middle classes, very similar to uh, Noel Coward. But occasionally you can also sense uh, uh, a tinge of disapproval. Or it seems as if Alan Agbon is critiquing the kind of lifestyles led by the, uh, the rich and famous, the bold and the beautiful, which is not there in uh, Noel Coward. Noel Coward seems to be wholeheartedly approving the lifestyles of uh, his characters. But um, Alan Agbon uh, occasionally... Uh, uh, critiques and uh, uh, disagrees with uh, what his characters are up to. Okay. Uh, after this, we come to uh, the revival of poetic drama in the 20th century. Now, as you all know, uh, drama in England began uh, uh, where the uh, medium was worse. All right. Uh, Elizabethan drama, Jacobian drama, all, right? all these were mainly composed in verse. But then after the restoration, suddenly playwrights uh, uh, started uh, using prose uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in uh, greater numbers. And prose now eventually replaced verse as the chosen medium in uh, uh, drama, so far as drama is concerned. And uh, then from 1890 to 1920, all right, the pure poetic play was almost non-existent in England. Uh, yes, in Ireland, during the Irish Dramatic Revival, uh, I believe somebody is going to talk about the Irish Dramatic Revival. Uh, so during the Irish Dramatic Revival, poets like uh, uh, W.B. Yeats and uh, James Singh, okay, Lady Augusta Gregory, uh, they used blank verse, all right, because they wanted to revive uh, the use of uh, verse and poetry in drama. And uh, so uh, they used a lot of uh, verse um, in their uh, plays. And uh, then uh, uh, in England, there was this writer, Stephen Phillips, all right, who wrote a play called Paolo and Francesca, which was modeled upon uh, an episode from Dante. And it was a great, great hit in 1900. And Stephen Phillips wrote other plays like uh, Herod, uh, A Tragedy, Ulysses, all right, the sin of David and Nero. Then the poet John Drinkwater. All right, John Drinkwater, um, he also tried to reestablish the poetic play in his earlier career. And his notable plays, Rebellion and the Storm, all right, they are all written in this style. Uh, W.B. Yeats, uh, Countess Kathleen, Kathleen May Holyhun, all right, all these are the uh, poetic dramas W.B. Yeats wrote. Uh, James Singh's uh, Riders to the Sea and the Shadow of the Glen. Although they are written in prose, it's a kind of prose poetry, very lyrical, very lyrical, so that uh, you hesitate uh, before calling them prose. All right? So now uh, critics call these plays by Singh 
plays written in uh, prose poetry, poetic form. Then in the uh, 1920s, we come across a crop of writers, uh, uh, many of them. Uh, there's Gordon Bottomley, uh, Lassell Abercrombie, uh, W.H. Arden, and above all, there is T.S. Eliot. Now, T.S. Eliot's contribution to verse drama, I'm going to discuss just a little later. Abercrombie and Bottomley uh, rescued the English drama when it was almost on the verge of decline. Um, Lassell Abercrombie um, tried to borrow from the earlier verse forms. He tried to reintroduce blank verse um, uh, into drama and uh, make verse the medium of dramatic expression. Uh, his plays like Deborah, The Adder, The End of the World, The Staircase, The Deserter, and The, the Deserter and the Phoenix. All right, they are some of his uh, romantic plays which are written using verse. And um, Abercrombie uh, endeavored to bring his poetry into close contact with immediate reality, contemporary reality. And uh, he also knew the stage very well. All right, he tried to um, ensure that his characters, they would behave uh, exactly as uh, um, real life uh, human beings do, okay, as contemporary human beings do. But the medium of exchange would not be prose. They would not be speaking in colloquial prose, but they would be speaking in colloquial uh, poetry, in verse, in very sonorous verse. And uh, his inspiration was the classical drama of Greece, mainly Sophocles and Skylars. And one of his most celebrated plays, which I have read, uh, is um, uh, King Lear's Wife. All right? It is um, uh, kind of not a spoof on Shakespeare, but uh, he borrows uh, characters from uh, British history and uh, gives us, you know, uh, King Lear before King Lear in Shakespeare. A young King Lear, his wife is on deathbed and uh, how King Lear is reacting to that. Okay, so, and why he became, uh, you know, the very egoistic, uh, very selfish uh, king of uh, Shakespeare's tragedy. So this is a prequel to uh, Shakespeare's King Lear. And uh, uh, Bottomley um, uh, also wrote plays like uh, uh, The Crier by Night, okay, apart from King Lear's wife, The Crier by Night, uh, Midsummer Eve, okay, Laudis and uh, Dane and Kate Kennedy. These are some of the best known plays by, um, uh, what shall I say, Bottomley. Okay, and uh, then uh, W.H. Auden and uh, Fry, uh, they also continued with the tradition. They wrote uh, plays like The Ascent of F-16, okay, and um, uh, other plays. But there won't be time uh, to, because of time constraints, we'll have to uh, kind of keep uh, Odin and uh, Fry, um, uh, you know, uh, for a later discussion. But uh, now let us come to T.S. Eliot. And in 1935, Eliot uh, was asked uh, to write a play for the Canterbury Festival. And uh, he wrote Murder in the Cathedral. And it became a landmark. It's a landmark in the history of modern poetic drama. And uh, here, of course, this is a, a, a historical play. Um, Eliot applies poetry to the stage very artistically and very powerfully. All right? There is so much emotional power in the play. Um, it is about, um, you know, the murder of uh, uh, Thomas Beckett. Archbishop Thomas Beckett of Canterbury by King Henry II. Okay, and it's a great, great play. So Eliot uses lots of elements from Greek drama in writing um, uh, his uh, first verse play, Murder in the Cathedral. So what are the basic features? What are the basic characteristics of poetic drama? All right, the basic features are its uh, diction, language, obviously. All right, the art of uh, uh, exchanging thoughts using poetry. All right, the technicality. And uh, poetry becomes a very powerful medium of expression in verse drama. Okay, the uh, rhythm of life, these playwrights, they, they try to capture the rhythm of life uh, uh, using their poetic imagination. And um, uh, these writers, um, uh, they try to incorporate a lot of theatricality, uh, a lot of stage action and characterization where verse becomes a necessity. Or not just a superimposition. And 
and um, unfortunately it was the the latter half of the 20th century especially 1970 onwards all right uh, words drama uh, almost disappeared from uh, the english and the american stage and uh, as of now uh, because uh, the ted use uh, it is believed he had this uh, project i think he has written one or two short plays uh, using verse but he had this project where he was going to uh, write the entire trojan war or to recapture the entire trojan war in a dramatic form using verse but uh, that project uh, remains uh, unfinished and now let us come to ts eliot uh eliot both through his uh, dramatic theory both through his critical theory and the practice of poetic drama he was able to establish a tradition of uh, poetic drama in the 20th century so what did he basically do eliot took to writing plays rather late in his career you know he was uh, a, a very successful poet with the publication of the wasteland and uh, uh, the hollow moon and uh, ash wednesday and the four quartets by the time he came to the stage and he was already a celebrated critic regarded as the uh, as the leading uh, critic of uh, contemporary of the 1920s uh, english critical uh, circle okay and uh, that gave him an additional advantage after he wrote murder in the cathedral uh, he wrote a number of critical essays where he tried to demolish many of the misconceptions about verse drama and he emphasized on verse drama's superiority over prose drama and tried to create and was able to create a favorable atmosphere all right a, a conducive atmosphere for verse drama and um, through his practice through the for, uh, the the five or six plays that he wrote he demonstrated that verse drama is possible in the modern stage and verse drama need not necessarily deal with uh, historical themes or uh, mythological themes verse drama can depict contemporary reality as well as uh, uh, the past as well as uh, historical or mythological um, episodes uh, eliot emphasized that there are uh, there uh, are certain conditions which must be fulfilled before one can achieve success in verse drama what are these conditions first it must be realized that uh, the difference between prose drama and verse drama is not merely one of medium is not just of medium itself okay uh, the themes of the two prose drama and verse drama they must be entirely different uh poetry drama uh, so far has been thought fit only for such themes which cannot be appropriately dealt with by naturalistic prose drama what eliot writes i quote no play should be written in verse for which prose is dramatically inadequate prose is dramatically adequate i'll repeat that no play should be written in verse for which prose is dramatically adequate okay if prose is sufficient to describe uh, the action to describe the emotions to describe the character to kind of depict the characterization then why uh, choose verse if prose is adequate then you don't have to choose uh, poetry uh the dramatic adequacy which demands a very poignant a very moving theme involving symbolic characters with imaginative atmosphere then such a uh, theme should uh, use verse uh, you know it means a kind of a fall back on the elementary emotional realities of life not the socio economic issues for that prose drama is sufficient but its emotions uh complex feelings which prose cannot um, portray all right very elementary very very complex extremely complicated very warped uh, emotions okay those emotional realities for that you need verse and through his practice eliot solved the thematic problem his verse plays are not concerned with the socio economic problems or right? they are not concerned with the external the external reality eliot's plays they are more concerned with the inner emotional and psychic realities okay so the core of his first play 
murder in the cathedral, which I have already uh, mentioned, 1935. All right, the core of this play is the psycho spiritual struggle of the protagonist, that is Archbishop Thomas Becket, and the temptations uh, which are offered to him and the temptations which he struggles to overcome. Okay, uh, you'll see when we discuss uh, the family reunion, which came four years later, 1939. Okay, uh, the psychological guilt complex of the protagonist, Harry, who's the, uh, you know, uh, the kind of a sacrificial figure uh, in the play. Uh, then 1949 came, uh, which I personally, in my humble opinion, consider to be Elliot's masterpiece, The Cocktail Party. Okay, The Cocktail Party is a study of uh, the inadequacies of married life, the expectations and the demands of married life, and our inability to fulfill those expectations in the modern context. All right, the cocktail party in 1949. Then in 1953, Eliot wrote The Confidential Club, which is a farcical drama of mistaken identity and confusion. Okay, and last, uh, his final play was The Elder Statesman, which came in 1958. The Elder Statesman discusses how conscience, human conscience, always revives the past and uh, how you must come to terms with the past in order to achieve spiritual illumination and redemption. This is again another very important theme in the family reunion. How the past, you have to make peace with the past. How you have to kind of uh, make adjustments, make compromises with the past before you can move on in life, before you can move forward. So for redemption, for spiritual illumination, uh, uh, reconciliation with the past is essential. Okay, so all of these uh, are Christian plays. Eliot believed that uh, religion is relevant to all human activity. And uh, I quote from Eliot, the purpose of the dramatist is to train people to be able to think in Christian category. And another quote from the critic D.E. Jones, Eliot contributed to the creation of the kind of wholeness of outlook without which poetry drama cannot be accepted as the normal mode of drama. Okay, and uh, in many of these plays, in many of these contemporary plays, Eliot uses the structure of a myth. Okay, in the cocktail party, he had used the, uh, the myth or the Alcestis myth. Okay, and uh, in uh, the family reunion, he uses the myth for uh, the uh, Orestes, uh, the Orestia. A trilogy by Skylus, okay, and uh, uh, Family Reunion is uh, uh, based on one episode from uh, uh, Skylus's uh, Orestia, Orestia trilogy, and that is called the Koifori, all right, the Koifori, uh, the libation bearers. Uh, the second precondition, according to Eliot, for the success of a poetic play is the availability of a form of verse the rhythms of which are closer to those of the spoken language. You cannot use blank verse anymore to discuss uh, uh, modern issues and modern topics and modern themes and modern mot motives. To show contemporary reality, you have to use a kind of verse which is very close to the, uh, the spoken language. And Eliot being, because he was such a great poet, those of you who have read Eliot's The Wasteland, uh, you'll know all right, how uh, comfortable he was uh, in using the various uh, rhythms, the speech patterns of uh, colloquial English. All right. And um, Eliot believed that the verse to be used today has to be necessarily different from the verse that was used in Elizabethan times. Okay. Uh, blank verse was okay for the Elizabethan playwrights, but uh, its potential has now been exhausted. And um, now it has become something of a handicap. And um, of course, in uh, Murder in the Cathedral, Eliot, uh, there are echoes of the Shakespearean blank verse, but um, uh, he tried to, uh, you know, create an uh, experiment with a, a new kind of uh, blank verse, which is, uh, um, you know, something unique uh, so far as the, so far as Eliot's style is concerned. With his second play, uh, The Family Reunion, he succeeded in evolving a speech pattern, a rhythm pattern, closer to our everyday spoken language. Okay, and uh, I quote from Eliot, 
a line of varying length and varying number of syllables with a cesura a pause and three stresses the cesura and the stresses may come at different places almost anywhere in the line the stresses may be close together or well separated by light syllables the only rule being that there must be one stress on one side of the cesura and two on the other total of three stresses and uh, in the cocktail party the verse almost you know you you uh, are not almost aware of the verse it is so light or right? it is so light it is so effortless the verse that eliot uses he is using contemporary idiom his contemporary using speech rhythm okay so uh, the second thing that eliot wanted is um, uh, the verse has to be different from blank verse and it almost has to resonate the uh, contemporary speech patterns and speech rhythms then uh, the third important condition that eliot laid down is that poetry should not be merely decorative in verse drama okay poetry is not an ornament it is not an uh, accessory not an embellishment to look at all right verse is a medium through which the audience must look at the action okay verse is not a uh, an additional uh, an attraction which you just uh, take randomly and place it on the play so that the play appears uh, very uh, decorative ornate and uh, very beautiful no verse has to be the the transparent medium through which you look at the play and uh, eliot makes a distinction between false rhetoric and true rhetoric and he says that employing false rhetorical utterances is incompatible with the concept of poetry as a media the rhetoric must sound sincere the rhetoric the poetic rhetoric that you are using as a uh, playwright it must um, be honest all right poetry should serve two purposes according to eliot okay uh, uh, first through poetic images as the objective correlatives objective correlatives is a term uh, eliot uses in his uh, famous um essay on hamlet the problem of hamlet okay uh, so uh, poetic images as the objective correlatives of the human uh, state of mind the human mindset and poetry should help in the revelation of personality you know the the pattern of character that is the first objective through poetry uh, the personality of the character should be revealed and secondly by using poetic symbolism the poet should be able to work out the implications of the theme the various nuances the various subtleties of the theme that the poet is trying to tackle all right the verse is using the poetry that is employing that should be able to uh, bring out those nuances of the theme and thirdly the setting of the play the scenic setting the backdrop of the play should be revealed through poetic manipulation of references okay so these are the three purposes poetry should perform. Form. and the last condition for the successful revival of poetic drama according to eliot is the reorientation of the attitude of the audience the elizabethan audience accepted uh, if i may use a term from coleridge with a sense of willing suspension of disbelief all right they accepted the convention that upper class characters they speak in verse and middle class or lower class characters they speak in prose So that convention was accepted by the Elizabethan audiences. Now, such a frame of mind does not exist today because nobody speaks in verse anymore in real life, all right? And uh, so, what happens is Eliot was afraid that the audience gets distracted the moment a character on stage opens his mouth and begins to speak in verse. The audience now does not uh, follow the action. The audience is now all uh, wondering. what is the next line what is the next line how is he going to make the next line rhyme so uh, verse actually acts as a, acts as a kind of a distraction uh, in um, uh, uh, verse drama verse can act as a distraction so a dramatist according to eliot should definitely avoid uh, uh, a mixture of prose and poetry eliot writes and i quote as i have said people are prepared to put up with verse from the lips of personages dressed in the fashion of some distant age they should be made to hear it from people dressed like ourselves 
living in houses and apartments like ours and using telephones and motor cars and radio sets what we have to do is to bring poetry into the world in which the audience lives and to which it returns when it leaves the theater not to transport the audience into some imaginary world totally unlike its own an unreal world in which poetry is tolerated he wrote quite a few essays on the technicalities the problems of verse drama all right so he says that the audience should be able to feel that this is very natural all right people who live resemble us people whose problems are similar to ours all right so say people who are using telephones people who are using modern uh, gadgets and conveniences okay so they they are speaking in verse it is as natural all right for these characters that is how natural the verse should sound and uh, after the murder in the cathedral eliot did not write a single play with a historical background all the plays are contemporary family reunion cocktail party uh, confidential slap and the elder statesman and uh, the critic ts first says in choosing to write poetic dramas about common everyday experiences eliot was undertaking the most startling experiment of all his works at no period had any previous writer attempted to do anything like this and after eliot odin and fry they followed in his footsteps but odin pretty soon lost interest in verse drama and uh, the other writers who wrote um, emulating eliot they were not really uh, either they were not uh, good poets or they did not understand drama so their drama became uh, very static and extremely boring although the poetry was at times uh, quite beautiful so eliot demolished all these fallacies all these uh, misconceptions that uh, there can be only one age of uh, one great age of poetic drama all right eliot single handedly revived poetic drama and made it possible all right to uh, show the wide range the exhaustive range of uh, uh, verse drama and how verse drama can uh, uh, reveal uh, the uh, the you know the heart Uh, the absolute, uh, the innermost um, uh, distortions and the innermost complications of uh, the characters, all right, in a very very new way, and uh, very complex states of our moral being, our spiritual being, uh, could be demonstrated through verse alone, all right, which prose cannot. Where prose stops, verse begins. So through verse, through poetry, very. complicated extremely complex extremely uh, multi uh, dimensional uh, human experiences and human emotions can be uh, uh, revealed on the stage but eliot was both a great poet and a very good student of drama so what eliot could easily perform okay the murder in the cathedral or murder in the cathedral was a big big hit uh, family reunion did not uh, do so well but cocktail party again was a great success and um, uh, confidential clerk and elder statesman all of them were moderate hits on the uh, stage but that kind of talent was not possessed by uh, the lesser uh, writers of verse drama and therefore in the 1950s after the uh, war came to an end verse drama died a natural death eliot wrote confidential clerk and uh, the elder statesman and they did reasonably well at the box office but uh, after the statesman nobody really uh, followed in eliot's footsteps and verse drama uh, died a natural death okay now we have uh, say another half an hour and i'm going to discuss uh, the play uh, the family reunion okay and uh, first i'll begin by uh, giving you the the mythological structure and uh, then we'll i'll give you a summary of the play and we'll conclude by discussing briefly some of the themes of the play so the play as i said eliot was fascinated by the uh, greek mythology and greek literature and greek drama in particular okay so uh, he uh, used uh, uh, as i said uh the the story of uh, uh, the very unfortunate young man young hero orestes and his mother clytemnestra okay and uh, you can i won't go into the uh, 
the details of the myth but uh, skylus uh, his only surviving trilogy is the oresteia trilogy okay and um, uh, the second part of the trilogy is the koifodi c h o e p h o r i the koifodi the libation bed okay in which uh, oresteus has discovered that his mother was responsible for um, killing her husband and his father agamemnon okay and um, uh, then he comes to take revenge and uh, very reluctantly he kills his mother Uh, for uh, patricide and uh, then he is pursued by the furies the renians all right the furies who are divine avengers and then orestes goes from place to place and later uh, he uh, is uh, thanks to the intervention of the goddess athena uh, orestes is forgiven and the furies now they become the humanides all right the gracious one the kind ones the gracious ones the humanities literally uh, that is the meaning in uh, of the greek term humanities so the furies they metamorphose or right? they are transformed into the humanities the gracious ones so this basic idea eliot had in mind when he wrote the play uh, the family reunion and the setting as i said is typically a uh, a uh, uh, like a drawing room comedy although this is not a comedy or right? it's far from being a comedy uh, it is a, a kind of a country estate called wishwood okay and in wishwood we have uh, lady monchense lady monchense whose name is amy so uh, as the play opens this is a what eliot did is he did not divide the family reunion into acts and scenes okay there are parts part 1 and part 2 all right and there are scenes in each uh, of these parts each of these halves so as the curtains go up we discover uh, the amy who is the lady monchense of this uh, wishwood estate and she is sitting in the dark she doesn't want she is very reluctant to have the lights turned on all right and uh, she has to sit in the house from october until june for in winter uh, the sun does not really warm uh, northern england and all she is doing is measuring time she is counting time all right and uh, she doesn't want night to come too soon and uh, the whole family uh, has gathered to celebrate her birthday the only absentees are her three sons but they are expected right they are expected that evening and uh, uh, the convey are having a rather insipid and tasteless conversation while they are waiting for the sons to arrive and uh, general and charles they are uh, amy's brothers in law they feel that uh, the younger generation is very irresponsible and very wayward okay uh, her younger sisters amy's two younger sisters whose names are ivy and violet all right they agree that youth is becoming rather decadent so this is happening in the drawing room of wishwood manor okay wishwood estate and uh, they are uh, talking about how the uh the younger generation how the new generation is nothing new you know whenever they elderly get together all right i'm sure you have seen this in your own homes whenever senior citizens get together all they can discuss is how the uh, youngsters are not what they used to be in their youth so ivy and violet also agree that uh, the youth of today is becoming decadent and now they ask mary her opinion okay and mary is uh, uh, amy's ward okay she is a representative of this new generation and she is a little disturbed by all these allegations and she is almost 30 now okay and she was always poor and remains unmarried she is something of a companion to uh, amy and mary thinks that she does not really belong to any generation she is too old to be uh, you know called uh, a youngster and uh, she is not even 30 so so she cannot uh, emotionally relate to uh the um, uh, old generation either the elderly is either and uh, amy lives only to keep wishwood the family estate together and ever since her husband died amy has been the head of the house and she knows that the family is getting older all of them are getting older and older her sisters and her brothers in law they are all getting you know advancing in years and soon death will come as a surprise for them all okay and only agatha who's uh, amy's older sister 
she seems to find death meaningful okay and uh, the oldest son amy's oldest son harry uh, has not uh, been in uh, in contact with the family for 8 years he has been wandering abroad and amy hopes that after harry comes back okay he can settle into the old routine at the family home but agatha is doubtful agatha says i don't know i mean he is uh, too uh, too much of a nomad or right? he is too much of a wanderer would he be able to settle down into these old uh, routines of uh, the country uh, lifestyle here uh, uh, agatha says the past is over all right the future can only be built on the present this is again a very favorite theme with eliot and he repeatedly discusses this time past and time future both perhaps present in time both perhaps uh, exist in time present all right these are ideas he discusses in the four quartets and um, uh, Uh, when harry comes back according to agatha he cannot pick up the strands uh, where he left them because eight years later this is going to be a new harry okay this is not going to be the same harry agatha wants uh, amy and the others and the others also begin to speculate uh, they do not like harry's wife they have met harry's wife and she is not named in the play okay a very demanding woman and uh, she persuaded harry to take her away from wishwood and what happened is while they were traveling uh, harry and his wife uh, there was a storm at sea they were traveling by ship and there was a storm at sea and she was swept overboard in a storm and amy says that uh, uh, we must feel no remorse for her death because we are not responsible and then they are surprised because harry is the first son to arrive right harry arrives on the scene uh he as he arrives is a little upset that the windows are left open the blinds are not drawn okay and uh, the others remind him that this is not the city this is the country all right the countryside and here there is nobody who is going to peep in nobody would eaves drop okay and uh, we notice something is wrong harry is constantly staring at the window all right as if he is being pursued by somebody or by something or right? he is constantly staring at the window harry alone can see the vengeful spirits the human ideas of uh, skylus's greek myth and uh, they have been uh, with him they have been uh, chasing him for quite a long time but only after he arrives at bishwood harry is able to um, uh, see them they become visible and he makes a um, a visible effort he makes an obvious effort to shake himself out of his trance and then he uh greets the assembled company in a normal way and now um, all the other relatives they begin talking of uh, everything that has been uh, waiting at home for him all right uh, amy has uh, kept things intact as they were so that harry uh, when he comes back is not uh, disturbed by any change and he becomes very impatient with this talk of um, you know resuming life from where he left it 8 years ago and uh, harry senses that they have become fossilized these old relatives of his but nothing ever happens to them they go through life half half asleep uh, harry is doing some soul searching all right uh, now uh, his uh, uh, soliloquy leads us to believe that in mid atlantic he had actually pushed his wife overboard and that is why the furies are always with him all right now they want revenge they want vengeance uh, for committing murder and of all the relatives assembled there only agatha seems to be able to understand harry uh, the others think that harry is exhausted and they urge him to go and uh, get some rest so when harry leaves they decide that the family doctor dr warburton he must be invited for dinner so that he can have a look at him Uh, uh charles and gerald the brothers in law they, they call in harry's servant downing harry's servant's name is downing they call him to question him uh violet and ivy object to this interrogation because they feel that this can lead to a kind of a uh, scandal in the neighborhood and uh, agatha does not object because she knows that questioning downing is as meaningless as irrelevant as calling in dr warburton because harry's problem is not physical 
It's psycho emotional spiritual. And Downing is very frank. Uh, he thinks that Harry's wife uh, did not have the courage to commit suicide. And uh, yes, Harry might appear a little distant. He might appear a little distraught. But um, Harry uh, usually appears very normal. All right. The only thing um, uh, Harry uh, Downing notices about Harry is that Harry was always too involved with his wife. All right. He was too fond of his wife, too much with his wife. So uh, now uh, we uh, are uh, privy to a conversation between Mary and Agatha. Mary appeals to Agatha for help. She wants to get away from Wishwood. All right. She knows that Amy wants um, uh, Mary to stay and marry Harry, who's now a widower. And in that, that way, now Amy is going to have a tame daughter-in-law for a companion. All right. She could not manage the first uh, Mrs. Harry. But Mary, she knows very well, and she'll, uh, she's um, very desperate to get Mary hooked with uh, Harry. And uh, uh, Agatha uh, says, uh, sorry, but uh, no help is forthcoming from her. She tells Mary that you should have had the courage to leave earlier. Now that Harry has returned, you cannot run away. And uh, then Harry talks to Mary about his fears and doubts. And uh, Mary tries to understand Harry's feelings that change is inevitable. And they reminisce about, you know, how they played uh, in a hollow tree as children. And then Amy had the tree cut down. So the, the hollow in the tree represents a kind of a surrogate womb for uh, Harry and uh, Mary. And uh, just like Clytemnestra's murder of Agamemnon. Okay, uh, Amy had the tree cut down. Again, at this point, uh, Harry sees uh, the Furies, the human IDs, uh, in the window. And uh, Mary is very startled by his abrupt change in mood. Okay, what she does is she pulls back the curtains and shows Harry that there is nobody outside. Now, Dr. Warburton, the physical, uh, the physician, uh, the family physician, he comes in uh, early for dinner to have a confidential talk with Harry. And uh, he, uh, you know, tries to convince Harry that Amy's health is very poor. And Harry now must relieve her of the burden of running Wishwood, running the estate. Uh, Harry recalls uh, how in his boyhood, uh, you know, he had this very unpleasant experience. Being good meant pleasing Amy. Whatever pleased Amy was good behavior. Okay. Uh, now he asks the doctor uh, some information about his father. Or he wants some information from Dr. Warburton about his father. And the old doctor assures him that there was no scandal. His father and his mother, they agreed to separate. And the father went abroad where he died. Suddenly at this point, a police sergeant comes in. All right, but uh, it's not uh, nothing very serious. He tells the family that uh, Harry's brother John, all right, he has had an uh, had an auto accident and uh, he has been uh, he has suffered concussion, and he cannot uh, be present for the family dinner. All right, so there's a lot of excitement in the family about John's accident. Um, Harry uh, shocks everybody by making uh, uh, the statement that it doesn't really matter because John is unconscious all the time anyway. All right? So a concussion is not going to make any difference to him. Now a long distance call comes, for, a call comes from the other brother. His name is Arthur. All right? He calls and he says that he too has been in an accident and his license has been suspended for uh, drunken driving. So uh, he too won't be able to uh, participate in the uh, family reunion. So Harry is still troubled about his father's abrupt departure and death uh, in a foreign country. And he presses Agatha for more detail. Agatha remembers his father's feeling. Okay? Uh, but his mother uh, complimented his weaknesses. And then finally, Agatha loses all her inhibitions and tells the truth. Okay? While Amy, she was such a domineering character and they never got along well, Amy and her husband, Harry's father. Uh, so when Amy was pregnant with Harry, uh, her husband, plan to kill her, to murder her. So Agatha talked him out of his scheme. Okay, Agatha prevented him from carrying out his plan. Uh, she could not bear to think uh, of, uh, you know, Amy's child, the life that she was carrying within her. 
that being destroyed. Okay, and now at this news, Harry feels a great relief, for the curse of the house now seems clearer. Right, the entire house is cursed because uh, there has been no murder. And when the human eyes appear again, now Harry is not frightened anymore. He knows that the Furies are not pursuing him. Right, he is following them. So Harry decides to leave Wishwood. Amy is furious at this news that Harry is going away, and she blames Agatha. All right, the sister who stole her husband 35 years ago. She accuses Agatha that you had an affair with my husband, and now you are also stealing my. You are taking my son away. Uh, Mary pleads with Agatha that uh, Harry must be stopped. Harry's departure has to be prevented. But uh, this is futile. All right, uh, this plea falls on deaf ears. Harry has now gone beyond the frontiers of reality, and uh, Mary asks Agatha's help. In uh, getting a job, or it may be a fellowship, so she can leave too. As the two women become more confidential, at this point, sometimes we are told that uh, while Agatha probably did not have an affair with uh, Harry's father, okay, uh, Agatha had deep feelings. Right? They had very tender emotional attractions. Uh, um, the brother-in-law and the sister-in-law, Amy's late husband and Agatha, and. Amy, uh, Mary, and uh, Agatha during their conversation, it is revealed that they too have seen the human IDs. Okay, they have seen these uh, divine agents of retribution too, and uh, that knowledge is a bond which unites them outside the stifling confines of Wishful. And when they talk with Harry's uh, with Harry's servant Downing, he confesses that he has also seen the Furies, but he doesn't really pay. any attention to them since he knows that they are not chasing him but his master hadi and finally in the last scene of the second part amy begins to understand what is happening at wishwood okay and the news comes as uh, uh, the family the rest of the family gather together the news comes that amy has died agatha and mary bring out bring in the birthday cake they blow out the candles as they circle around it in a kind of a ritualistic movement partly a dance movement and the rest of the family they begin talking about the will harry has already left so it's a very uh, rich multi layered and uh, very very complex kind of a play a lot of themes uh, occur i'll discuss only some of the major ones okay um, the matriarch amy she is stuck in the past she cannot move forward she cannot let her family move forward so this is a family which is uh, caught in a time warp or right? it is caught in a kind of is fossilized in time and the most obvious theme is the existence of family secret every family has skeletons in the cupboard okay and uh, those secrets they are uh, handed down from generation to generation and uh, that kind of becomes a curse in the family itself amy has held a secret from her son harry his father had attempted to kill her while harry was still in her womb uh, harry um, uh, used had become emotionally and physically estranged uh, from his first wife and uh, that very wife whom he allegedly pushes overboard from a ship uh, killing her but that is which he did not do that was more in his imagination he never killed his wife so uh, the fact that the family secret has been sustained all right seems to prompt for fate to repeat itself in harry's own life the father could not kill amy but harry imagined that he has killed his own wife so harry lives in a consistent battle of guilt and the fear of retaliation that's why he fears he sees the human ideas the second thing that uh, uh, becomes evident with the family secrets is uh, the effects of providence or the effect of fate in the lives of the unredeemed unless one cycle ends the other cannot begin unless the past is consigned uh, to the dustbin of history the present cannot start in this family nothing ever comes to a closure okay so the this family is in a continuous vicious cycle of repetitive existence what happens in the past is happening in the present will happen again in the future and uh, an example of this mentality comes from amy herself she feels that if she perpetuates her life then 
a family will sustain itself a family will continue all right actually she wants to perpetuate the past in the false belief that it will bring her changing family she can sense that the family is changing but if the if she continues to uh, maintain the facade of the past then the family will be brought back in the way she remembers it this is what amy says i keep wishwood alive to keep the family alive to keep them together to keep me alive okay by keeping the past alive amy wishes to achieve a kind of immortality another recurring theme in the play is that of isolation all right specifically the kind of the sense of isolation which one feels only within a family group those of you who have been to reunions and family occasions you know on diwali or christmas when the entire family has come to you feel as if you can't relate these are strangers and yet they are your flesh and blood okay but within a year so much uh, distancing occurs so this is again another theme that eliot has explored in many of his uh, poems too especially the wasteland which is a poem about how self isolated we are even in the Uh, the midst of our near and dear ones okay and many of the primary characters in this drama harry uh, agatha mary they either express this isolation or they are viewed by others in terms of isolation even marginal characters such as violet they seem to feel shades of this uh, existential angst at the opening of the play amy expresses a desire to keep the family together yet during the course of the play together becomes the opposite of many what many of the other characters in the play feel okay from the moment he returns home harry's sense of emotional isolation from his family becomes obvious to uh, the audience he is very agitated he speaks of uh, the eyes that watch him and notices that um, others cannot see these uh, spirit figures these human eyes okay um, uh, he returns to the family after uh, an eight year absence and he is told by his mother that the estate is now his to manage it's as if she is putting a massive burden uh, on his shoulders and harry feels alienated from everyone else by uh, the differences in what and how they see but uh, he also feels alienated by virtue of the fact that the others cannot comprehend him he cannot understand these um uh, strangers who are supposed to be his relatives nor can they understand him and he feels that uh, they are all i am quoting from the po po uh, from the play they are all quote people to whom nothing has ever happened and who therefore are unable to perceive the unimportance of events harry feels that there is a vast difference between what has occurred to him what has happened to him and the events that have occurred at wishford which would you know things have been repetitive things have been repetition of the past as i already said which would is a um, uh, a place fossilized in time it's a frozen place frozen in time whereas harry has experienced momentous changes he has seen his wife die all right and uh, he believes that he is responsible for her death and the others at which would they are clearly mystified by his statement and later when harry and agatha speak privately he begins to realize that agatha alone is capable of comprehending him is capable of grasping his meaning in a way that others cannot and his sense of isolation now begins to dissipate because of agatha's empathy and harry states that somehow he feels quote happy for a moment as if i had come home his homecoming begins now with agatha's show of empathy meanwhile mary also expresses her own sense of isolation from the family she is an outsider she is somebody who's uh, been brought up in the family but uh, is not related to them by blood all right in fact for mary this sense of isolation extends beyond the borders of her uh, adoptive family and early on in the play mary states that she does not quote unquote belong to any generation she cannot identify with the youngsters she cannot identify with the seniors she feels that her youth has passed her by i'm close to 30 now i'm almost an old lady and uh, i too waited with amy for harry 
but uh, she cannot relate to the elderly group of Amy's siblings either. In her conversation with Agatha, Mary states that neither she nor Agatha truly belong at Wishwood. They are physically there, but uh, yet uh, um, psychologically, emotionally, they are outsiders. And speaking with Harry, uh, Mary expresses this sense that uh, of um, unbelonging at Wishwood. She describes herself as a misfit. She calls herself superfluous. And Agatha's isolation is recognized by herself and others. But she does not dwell so much on her feelings of isolation. Uh, uh, Agatha does not even contradict Mary when Mary tells her, I quote from the play, you don't belong here any more than I do. And Agatha acknowledges this mutual isolation and she defines her role. What is her role and Mary's role vis-a-vis -vis the family? Quote, Agatha is saying this, quote, you and I, Mary, are only watchers and waiters. We don't get involved. Right? We are outsiders. We are watch. We are, we are, we are watchers. We are, we are watching the events unfold before us. But we do not get involved. All right? We are not participants in the action. We are only watchers and waiters. We are waiting for things to change. The past to come to a closure and the present to begin its journey towards the future. And one final theme to consider is the element of change and the importance of growth and development, progress, forward movement, time and its passage, along with the, uh, the peripheral changes. These are important themes in the play. Uh, from the very beginning, Amy insists that nothing has changed at Wishwood. You know, she reminds me of this character, uh, Mrs. Havisham, in uh, Dickens' Great Expectation, who kind of tried to keep things as they are in her bridal chamber. Okay, and uh, Amy also tries to keep, to, uh, right from the beginning, she insists that nothing has changed at Wishwood. And she had deliberately kept everything the same since Harry's departure. So that once Harry returns, he'll feel comfortable, he'll feel welcome and at home, okay, and he'll be able to settle down at Wishwood. And repeatedly throughout the play, she keeps stating, nothing has been changed. The Wishwood estate awaits the return of Harry, and he's the only member of the family who left the immediate circle, who went away, who wandered off the immediate circle. And they are a little apprehensive, the other family members. They are a little fearful of Harry, all right, because he's the one who got away from Wishwood, which probably they all want to. Uh, in uh, uh, Professor Mahesh Al-Bunchuwa's Wara Chirabandi, all the characters, they want to get away from the Wara. But the more they try, the more the Wara sucks them in. Uh, Mary insists on getting away from Wishwood, but uh, somehow it is very difficult. It's more difficult than it uh, apparently is. Uh, Harry lingers at Wishwood, agonizing over his past and his sense of guilt until Agatha inspires him and urges him forward. From this point, the play gets into motion. Okay, Harry resolves to leave, as does Mary. Uh, Amy, who represents um, uh, stasis, uh, all right, uh, Amy, who represents um, uh, the um, stability of time, all right, Amy, who represents uh, the absence of change, she has to die. Unless Amy dies, uh, life cannot move ahead. So Amy uh, very considerately dies and life is now renewed. Agatha reiterates, Agatha mentions this, that the curse has now been, the curse has ended, the curse has been lifted from uh, Wishwood and now time can once again move forward. Okay, Time need not be at a standstill at the estate. Now we can look forward. And for that, Amy had to die because Amy was the one who was holding time back. Therefore, the closure of the past uh, in order to allow the future all right, is a, a permanent issue in this space. So, uh, to conclude, uh, the family reunion, the richness of the play, the richness of the family reunion lies in its range of multiple meanings. All right, there are layers and layers of overtones, uh, which at one level or another, can reach uh, the perceptive individual. 
but then you have to read continuously read between the lines we uh, when i was a student at the university we studied uh, the family reunion as part of our mphil program we had a, an entire course on ts eliot and we had to study virtually everything by eliot all right including his fiction non fiction uh, sorry he didn't write fiction his drama okay uh, non fiction poetry all right so there was no fixed syllabus as such whatever eliot wrote the entire oeuvre of ts eliot so at the time i did not i of course uh, liked uh, the family reunion but i preferred the cocktail party all right and uh, only after having taught the play have i understood the the subtleties which eliot has incorporated into the text and uh, no modern dramatist actually um, uh, kind of adds so many layers to his dramatic text uh, as peter klein says eliot brings to the stage a depth profounder in its implication than anything previously realized in drama so the dramatic performances you have to watch repeatedly after a two or three times then the significance of everything that eliot is trying to communicate becomes clear if you are not if it is not possible to watch the play come obvious uh, with each uh, consecutive reading this depth is achieved through various levels of meaning you know the undercurrents of mythology the psychoanalytical framework the symbolism the literary references in the play and the religious connotation okay as well as through the power of the play's poetic and dramatic feeling on any of these levels all right uh, um, a member of the audience can relate to any of these levels that uh, eliot is trying to um, uh, convey uh, through the play eliot believed that yes uh, today there are many fears many nightmares many hypocrisies uh, there is a lot of disillusionment all right which are the concerns of playwright and yet in spite of all these negativities there is something in the world where worthy of being discovered if only one persists in its quest in the wasteland all right the questers they uh, pursued the holy grail unfortunately they could not reach it but um, eliot believed that if you strenuously uh, persist in your goal of uh, achieving the grail then that can be found and uh, american playwrights like albee and miller in their plays um, the theme appears to be that the dreams Uh, which we have striven for they have all come to naught or right, they have all ended in failure uh, 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 you know they they deal in themes of despair not so eliot okay eliot believes that yes the human condition cannot be ignored all right it is um, uh, these are you know uh, practical terms uh, which we all must acknowledge but as a reaction against this kind of um, uh, cynical um, uh, negative uh, pessimistic outlook sets in all right the significance of eliot's plays like the family reunion become increasingly clear the play offers hope that even at great cost if you come to terms with the past then it is possible to move ahead it is possible for us to grow personally to grow spiritually and move ahead in life thank you so much for listening to me patiently i hope i have been i wish i could uh, read the uh, the play out but one and a half hours really uh, is not sufficient to discuss a play of uh, this uh, kind of complexity and uh, a play with so many layers and so many different levels of understanding okay so um, i hope that at some other time we'll be able to uh, meet again and discuss this play in greater detail once again a huge thanks to the organizers for having me here today thanks to uh, dr kartik panikkar and thanks to dr kapil singhal for uh, doing all the networking and the behind the scenes uh, uh, activities you don't you have no idea student how much effort it requires all right to make uh, such a course such an online course 
to enable such an online course for you all. You have to really be thankful that these four colleges they are organizing a course like this so that uh, you can benefit from the expertise of all uh, the teachers from various colleges. So, on my personal behalf, uh, a big round of applause uh, to all the organizers. This is really something very, very fruitful and very worthwhile. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Supanta Bhattacharya, sir, started with uh, the background topics, uh, starting with the drawing room comedy, uh, which is uh, which mostly consists of upper middle class characters. He told us the basic features of uh, poetry, drama, and how uh, T. S. Eliot single-handedly uh, is responsible for the revival of uh, this genre of poet of uh, of literature. That is what sir has told. Then, uh, after summarizing the uh, play, the family reunion, he has introduced us to the different themes, and at the end. He has uh, suggested the, the students how they can relate themselves uh, to the play. So, uh, uh, a big thank to you, sir, on behalf of uh, the four organizing colleges and the participating students. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Supanta Bhattacharya once again. And you, sir. now the session is over. Thank you. Good day. Everybody. Thank you very much, sir. It's always a pleasure listening to your lectures. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay. And thanks, thanks so, for all the effort. Thanks for the hard work. No, no, it's always, I mean, always a pleasure doing it for the students. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So students will meet uh, today evening uh, for uh, Professor Bojra Sri Ramesh lecture. Okay, sir. So we call it. Bye. Day. Bye.